everyone. I am uh, I'm Guilty Gyoza. I go by Guilty or Gyoza, both fine. Uh, my co-founder of Topology. We are building games uh, fully on chain on Starknet. Okay, um, so uh, we're, we're going to talk about a lot of, about video games today, and uh, we think that there are a lot of past evolutions in the game industry. Right? And every time video games transformed, right? Uh, last time around, mobile came, and we have mobile casual games, and mobile give us access to games 24/7. But we think that blockchain will transform video games in a very different way. We think blockchain will bring significance to gaming because blockchain is the place where things are immutable, they are permanent, they are hard. And so things happening on chain has significance, and so it will transform video games in a very unique way. <coughs> we think that the game industry right now is akin to Web 1.0, so we're kind of calling it Game 1.0. Uh, what Game 1.0 means that there are very few people creating video games and the majority of people are consuming the video games. So there's a massive skew towards uh, read. Very few people write to the uh, game as a medium. Uh, this is like recent statistics in the United States. Uh, for every one employee in the game industry, there's 1,000 gamers in the US. And so you know, when we think of gamers, we think of people, the persona where people are consuming the content and uh, game logic provided by the game developer, while the game developer created the content, program everything to give you the experience. All right, so uh, a bunch of video games here. On top left, we have Fortnite. Um, when you play Fortnite and you basically, uh, that's uh, port of four, you basically click your left mouse button, aim, and release your left mouse button, and you deploy a castle. And all you do is engage with your mouse, but the game developer did all the fun stuff, right? Modeling the castle, programming, uh, creating the computer program that would model the castle, place, it, place the geometry in the scene, and so on. All the wonderful stuff. And you as a gamer are only enjoying the mouse clicking action. That is kind of unfortunate. We think the game developers are enjoying so much by creating games, and gamers are thus far still passively consuming what is provided to them. Um, on the right, you have uh, Street Fighter, and so when you're using uh, spe your special um, Hadouken in this case, um, you're pressing a, a combo of keys and you're triggering the computer logic programmed by the developer. You're not doing anything more than that, right? But the computer programmers did a, a bunch of interesting things, drawing the animations, programming every little bit of the logic to give you that experience. Um, same for uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint, same for Witcher 3, uh, CDPR. Uh, there's just a lot of things that go behind the scene game developers did, and we as gamers are consuming the content and experience provided by them. Now, this sounds terribly like game uh, Web 1.0, right? And so how do we go to game 2.0? Um, well, one way to, is to think about system one and system two. This is uh, thinking fast and slow. Um, and so when you play video games, a lot of fast twitch, keyboard and mouse, that's system one. System two is like slow thinking, st strategic thinking, right? Uh, burning your brain sort of thing. Um, in fact, a lot of the 10,000 hour games, so-called games with incredible depth, they are engaging system two uh, in intensely. Right, so this is the uh, beloved Age of Empire two. Uh, we are looking at uh, the famous MBL, placing a town center next to the opponent's town center. This is the famous Persian douche, right? And so. By playing Persian, you enjoy like half resource placing your town center or building your town center, and your town center has double HP. And so you can basically pull this troll off, right? So kill your town center, move all your villagers to the front, and build, rebuild your home right next to the opponent's home, and just shoot down your opponent's uh, TC. This is a funny thing. And game developers program everything. Um, you know, uh, program the, the logic, program setting all the parameters that define what each, what each civilization means. As a gamer, we engage our system through, we think strategically about these different strategies to utilize the logic provided by the game developer. But still, we cannot touch the, the game code, right? Well, other than modding, right? But the um, canonical primary game operated by the game developer, we can't touch it. We can only modify the game um, as um, fans. Okay, so uh, when it comes to players creating things in game, we have to talk about UGC. We just have to talk about it. User-generated content. And uh, when it comes to UGC, uh, it's, it has a very long history. So this is uh, Ghost Recon uh, Future Soldier. 
as FPS player, we love customizing our guns. We like to we love to customize how our scope is, how our muzzle is, our magazine size, all that stuff. Um, another kind of customization is the appearance editor. So this is a Naraka Blade Point. People love to customize their avatar, how they appear in games. And this customizer gives you the ability to sort of parametrically uh, play with the sidebars to tune every little details about your uh, facial expression and your body appearance. Um, just to give you a benchmark, so this is a game with like Chinese uh, uh, Kung Fu Wuxia kind of background uh, with some Japanese influence. But with the parametric facial editor, player gamers are creating r ridiculous stuff, you know, like Iron Man, uh, uh, Geralt from the Witcher 3 series and so on. It's like incredible stuff. Right, so we, we have felt this trend where gamers want to actively participate in creating games, creating things that exist in games. Um, we have to talk about Roblox if we talk about UGC. So this is the Roblox editor where um, an interface is provided to gamers, mostly young kids, very young kids, that are using this interface to design their little worlds and design the little games for other kids to play. And furthermore, there's a scripting language embedded in the interface, which is the Lua uh, scripting language. So young kids are learning Lua in order to play Roblox and create games for their friends to play. So this is very cool. And let's come back to blockchain for a little bit. Dark Forest, we have to talk about Dark Forest if we talk about on-chain games. And what's fun, really fun about Dark Forest is we have a whole part of the game that is not provided by the game developer, right? Gamers are writing plugins and scripts that are automating, ver automating various different things. And uh, there's like whole marketplace also created by uh, gamers, not the developer, that are hosting these different plugins. And these are all user-generated content, user-generated scripts. So this is really fun. But can we take it a step further? Um, so I like to use this mental model, uh, thinking in like schematic terms. So let's start with this. We have a set of rules, the gate rules of the game, and basically the rules would spawn a space of play. Right? So if like in linear algebra, you will have like a basis spawning a vector space, kind of like that concept. Right? So the rules define the boundary of play. Outside a boundary is illegal. You can play within the boundary. Now let's put the people here. So we have gamers playing in the space of play, and we have developers that are building the rules, and the rules exist as computer code. Right? That's what video games is. And um, the way gamers can influence the rules thus far is, is indirect, right? So the gamer can choose to play or not play a game, or the gamers can go to Steam and upvote or downvote a game or put negative comments to influence the developer to change the rules of the game. And so gamers have indirect way of influencing the game and it's basically engaging market forces and capitalism so that you know, game developer would sometimes are aligned with gamers. They would change the game towards what gamers want. Sometimes they will fail and the game would die. Um, now let's put blockchain into the picture. So what if we run the rules of the game on chain? Right, so rules define transitions from game, st game state to game state and their computation, right? So we can write this computation in the form of smart contracts and put it on chain. So we have a games running fully on chain. When the rules are enforced on chain, we have an on chain game, like right? Dark Forest, uh, Conquest, Excrecia, and so on. What's interesting here is that because the rules are on chain, they're transparent. People can audit it, and we can also govern it. So we can say, well, no change can be made to the on-chain game unless some community, you know, reach a consensus to approve it or disapprove it. Right? So we can put an end gate there. That logical end says, developer can develop new feature, but it is gated by some governance decision. Players have to pass that proposal for the new feature to be implemented into the game. And because the game is on chain, we can govern it in a, in a fully transparent way. And notice that the play, uh, stroke color of play is the same as stroke color of govern. Uh, we think it's important for the gamers to govern the game, um, not coin voting, not people with uh, you know, a capital power. And so you have to play the game to have a share to, to govern the game. And basically, we can just replace the game with the, with the DAO. So that right there is a DAO, right? We can have a DAO that governs the game where every change made to the game has to be approved by the gamers, and gamers would get governance right by playing the game, not by buying DAO tokens on the market. And I think DAO Forest establishes a path here, which is gamers themselves are developers. They write programs that enhance the gameplay, that expand the gameplay, and so we can perhaps break that boundary 
we are all gamers, building games, playing games, and governing the games. Um, lastly, I want to add one last component there. Um, so, so far we have established that in order to change the rules of the game, we need consensus, right? So the DAO will form some kind of consensus to approve a new feature to be added to the game, a new character or a new special ability or nerfing or buffing something. Um, another way to uh, change the rules, perhaps, is through some um, autonomous route. So imagine some meta rules beneath the rules that are just completely immutable. And they dictate the, some kind of algorithmic change of the rules. Uh, one example I can, I can think of is, imagine uh, Darwin, Darwinism evolution. So the meta rules will be the Darwinian evolution, and the rules will be the species, what exists in the world. Right? And, and the evolution doesn't change, but the species change over time. Right? New species come up, some species goes into extinction, and so on. But there is some kind of algorithm, the meta rules, that govern the autonomous evolution of games. And this perhaps is, can be called as autonomous games. Okay, um, so we're making this thesis that we think game right now is at game 1.0 and we are moving towards game 2.0, which we think will have such significance, it's a different kind of reality and we're calling them on-chain reality. And it has a couple uh, characteristics. Uh, first of all, the core game systems are fully on-chain, so it's fully transparent, auditable, in small contracts. Um, it's immutable by default, and it's only immutable either by some kind of consensus reached by the community, um, and there should not be uh, coin voting involved. That's why it's called merit-based uh, consensus. Or, or by some kind of autonomy of smart contracts. So smart contract runs some algorithm that dictates the change of rule, and the algorithms are immutable, and so no one can change the, the laws of the universe, basically. Uh, in order to demonstrate these concepts, we at Topology have made a on-chain game or on-chain reality called Isaac. Isaac is the first name of Newton, uh, Isaac Newton because we're running uh, basically the three-body problem in a small contract. And um, for people who have read the three-body problem story, uh, it's by a chi famous Chinese sci-fi novelist. Um, and um, essentially imagine a solar system where there are three suns. And, and there's like a planet that revolves around these three suns, and it's a very poor planet, right? At any given moment of time, you may be crashing into a sun or getting too close or too far away from the sun, so you will be either too hot or too cold, and so on. It is a very harsh environment. And so players have to work together to change their fate. And so Isaac is a game inspired by these stories, the three-body problem, and also the wandering earth by the same uh, novelist, and also the famous factorial um, uh, building game, resource management game. Documentation open source, uh, small contracts all open source, and we're currently doing close alpha. All right, so the game can be understood as uh, three suns and a planet. Everyone is on the same planet, and uh, everyone is building these production pipelines that are harvesting resources and transforming resources, and eventually they build uh, planetary engines. This is the wandering earth story. And so imagine planetary engine as a rocket, right? And you basically mount your rocket on the surface of the planet and you launch the rocket. And you know, by Newton's third law, there will be a reaction, right? So you can drive your planet by launching the rocket. That's essentially how uh, players work together to build rockets, place their rockets, and launch them to drive their planets uh, here and there to dodge the sun and evade the sun. And eventually they can escape the suns if they can drive, accelerate their planet to escape velocity, so they can just escape from this hell, hellish environment. And that constitutes a win, right? So the game treats uh, uh, escaping the solar system as a win. All players win together. And when the planet crashes into a sun, all players die and lose together. Okay, so uh, this is a screenshot from the front end. We have three suns and a tiny planet. Um, and uh, this is the uh, screenshot of the front end where players are building pipelines that harvest resources and transform resources and so on. Uh, this is in close alpha. Okay, so um, again, all players are united against a common objective. There is no PVP. Uh, it's entirely co-op PVE. And uh, what's special about this, technically speaking, is that the physical laws is operated in a small contract. And also the regulations that you know, dictate the logistics, um, you know, how, how much resource is harvested, is transformed, every single tick and so on. All these different things are enforced in a smart contract. So what do we mean by physics? 
Uh, when we talk about when we talk about suns and planets, right? Orbital mechanics. We have to talk about uh, uh, Newton's law of gravitation. So we have the inverse square law, right? The further you are, the less gravitational pull you exert on me, and, and so on. And we are approximating this using the standard numerical method, right? So for anyone taking classes in uh, numerical simulation, you will know this is the standard, very simple uh, fourth order runge kuda method for approximating the, uh, uh, the differential equation of the gravitational law. And we are running this, basically this numerical simulator in the Cairo small contract on StarkNet, on Ethereum, so that's the layer two. Um, and um, there's also a chaotic system. All right, so three body problem is a chaotic problem. So we are living in a solar system with two bodies, we and the sun, and everything is pretty stable. We just go around in circles and ellipses. But in a three-body problem, uh, things are very chaotic. You can't really project far enough into the future where you are, and that's why uh, it's easy to go into destruction. But when we run everything on a blockchain, everything is transparent and deterministic. Right? So as a gamer, I can take the contract from the blockchain and run it locally, basically run it forward by like 1,000 ticks, and I can perfectly predict what will happen in the next 1,000 ticks. Everything is deterministic. Okay, so that reduces the difficulty. So we can put back to chaos by injecting some randomness. And again, uh, randomness, oracle, the, the, the rabbit hole. So we're not doing any oracle. We are deriving random numbers from player actions. If you, if you know uh, Fiat Shamir, we're taking inspiration from Fiat Shamir. Um, randomness is derived from sort of hashing together a bunch of player actions in the last tick. And so players either optimize their actions and forget about gaming the randomness, or they game the randomness, but they, they make a bunch of uh, unreasonable player actions, so either one or, or the other, which we think players would definitely choose to do the right action and forget about gaming the randomness. So this is the, uh, the Fiat Shamir idea. Um, again, there are production lines and there are power grids, and so the problem is about players working together to solve this optimization problem um, at the civilization level. So it's a massive co-op factorial game. Um, Multi-ingress, we like the idea that when we make a game, we want people with different backgrounds and interests to come in. Right? So if you think about Counter-Strike. It attracts people that love uh, muscle twitches and shooting people, uh, and that's not everyone. Right? And so this game uh, caters to uh, different people. Uh, people want to look at circuit layouts, um, engineers. People want to look at production throughput, uh, right? Uh, people working in like um, heavy industries and just, uh, or oftentimes just nerdy about throughput optimization. Um, people that have interest in physics and want to look at the orbital mechanics, they can come in and look at that. And finally, there's the human coordination problem because everyone needs to work together to pilot their planet around, right? And imagine a planet with 1,000 people all in the same Discord channel, and they're all discussing who to do what when. That's a human coordination problem. And so people who love to do that can join the universe and help coordinate people just by talking. They don't play the game. And finally, just like Dog Force, this game is client agnostic. So game running on chain, everyone can build a front end that interface with the game and visualizes the game. And so this also presents a client building game. How to build the best client that visualizes the game in an optimal and enjoyable way. Uh, just as a bonus, we are doing uh, open alpha soon and we put up this on-chain puzzle constituting uh, 50 different puzzles and we're saying that one account can only solve one puzzle and only when you solve a puzzle can you, uh, choose to, can you join the Isaac later. And so if you haven't already solved a puzzle, when later we do open alpha and you send a transaction to join Isaac, your transaction will revert. Right? So this is kind of a way to say, well, you need to have already solved the puzzle to be able to participate in our alpha, and it's all on chain. And finally, coming back to governance, we think governance is super important here, um, and we want to explore non-coin voting mechanism. So we're uh, pushing this idea called Car Style. Uh, Cars is uh, coming from James Cars, the author of the uh, proposer of the concept Infinite Game. Uh, Car Style is essentially um, a governance pattern where you govern in order to govern more and play more, instead of you play in order to win and stop playing. So this is a concept of Infinite Game. Okay, so the schematic of car style is you as players on the top left will play the game, which is the subject there, and if you play the game well, you would earn voice in the DAO, right? And the, and the voice will be mapped into votes, and you can vote on uh, proposals. Proposals are 
exactly on-chain changes to the on-chain game. So everything is fully auditable. There are small contracts. Um, in, order, in order to have governance right or voice in the DAO, you must play the game well. The voice is not some token on the market you can buy. So you have to play Isaac well to get voice, to have votes, to vote on proposal, to govern the change of Isaac on-chain in order to play Isaac better and repeat that process, right? So you play more to play better and so on. Uh, instead of having this sort of DAO token uh, mechanics where if you buy DAO token, you would somehow vote for proposals that would get the price appreciated and then you will exit and then you will stop governing. That's finite game and we are all about infinite game. So this is the architecture uh, diagram of Isaac. So Isaac implements the cards DAO pattern. You have the DAO governing the game on chain. Um, the proposal uh, contract, the charter contract, everything is on chain. So every change made to the DAO needs to be approved by the voters and voters are gamers, they play the game. And finally, we want to mention our partners. Uh, Yagi builds the ticker on StarkNet. It's, you, can, you can see it as a clock, basically the, the gelato network on layer one, but on StarkNet layer two. And Apibara is the indexer that listens to all events emitted from the Isaac contracts and, and uh, put up a nice backend for the front ends to query uh, efficiently. Okay, and lastly, we want to talk about our upcoming unannounced project. Uh, we want to explore more the space of play. We are very inspired by DogForce. Uh, the ability for gamers to write scripts and automating things and expanding the complexity of play. We want to do something like that. And we want also want to explore meta rules. So meta rules, again, are these algorithms on chain that are immutable. They would evolve the game algorithmically. And so the, game are, game, the rules of the game are evolving by some algorithm. You can call that autonomous game. And we want to build this on chain, obviously. And we are exploring the fighting game mechanics. We love fighting games. And, um, oh, it's not repeating. And so what you're seeing is, is a female character with a katana. And um, can we repeat the, the video again, sorry? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's a female character with a katana. And what she did is, you know, a forward dash, a backward dash, then a forward dash, but she cancels the forward dash into a attack, a sequence of attack animation. So, uh, you know, for people who play fighting games, you will know what I'm talking about. And what's special about this game is there is an AI that drives the character. So this sequence is not controlled by me pushing keyboards and mouses. This uh, sequence of action is driven by some very rudimentary AI in a small contract that dictates the behavior of this girl. Um, also, the physics is, is in, in a small contract, obviously. So, you know, the characters move forward and backward, accelerate, deaccelerate. The physics is the physics is enforced in a small contract. Um, yeah, so this is our next experiment, and we are very excited to explore the paradigm of game 2.0. Uh, we think we are moving into this new paradigm, and in order to build this, we are in need of talents. And so, we're looking for a small contract engineer. We're looking for research engineer and also front end designer. If you're interested in this vision, come talk to us. Thank you.